Welcome to my talk. Uh, it's called Ember CLI Rails, an integration love story. Um, I, wrote the, I wrote the title before I wrote the talk, so the love story thing has been done better by other people. So this is more of a, a history of the interaction between Rails and Ember. Um, so the title is not necessarily relevant to the rest of the talk. Um, my name is Jonathan Jackson. I work at a place called HashRocket. It's pretty cool. Uh, you can reach out, me, uh, reach out to me at these relevant links. If you want to take, take the time to go back to maybe 2014 or so, you can visit my blog. That's probably the last time I blogged there. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, email me anytime you want if you have any questions. Uh, so I mentioned I work at HashRocket. Um, there are these clowns in front. Um, they're pretty cool. They're very supportive. I think that's the thing that I would define them <laughs> define in them the most. So this is uh, this is the my project manager right here. This is the first thing he said to me before I started this talk. You're the worst, and you're going to blow it. But remember, you're the best, and you got this. He's kind of like being wishy-washy here. And then uh, you know, it's not just the Rocketeers that are currently in service. Uh, we have Rocketeer alum that try to jump in here and you know help out, obviously. Uh, and then. This morning, about two hours ago, I, I said I was excited and nervous. And there, the picture's not there, but it's me being very excited and nervous. Uh, and the TMOC 12, Taylor Mock, he's, uh, he's working with me on a, a very large Ember app. And, and he said, as long as you use a lot of GIFs, you'll be fine. But I don't have any, so uh, now I've failed him. So once again, hash rocket, it's pretty cool. We're also hiring. Um, OK, so I'm a bit of an Ember uh, fanatic. I've been interested in Ember for a long time. Uh, and to that end, uh, recently we started a, I, I organized a group called Ember Jacks. This is a Jacksonville Ember Meetup group. And uh, with the help of Tildy and Lindsay Wilson, we were able to get this really cool Tomster made up for us. Um, it's, it's a paddleboarder. If you've never seen a paddleboarder, come to Jack's Beach. If you're ever in Jack's Beach, you should come to our meetup. It'll be fun. Uh, I also co-host Ember Weekend, which is a podcast on Ember. It talks about Ember-related topics. It's mostly news stuff and things that we've learned while dogfooding Ember apps. Um, so check that out. And maybe there will be a shameless plug at the end if we have time. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so I'm Jonathan Jackson. And uh, a little bit about my history with Ember. Lately, I've been working on a very large Ember app uh, with just you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, complexity, and it's been really challenging and fun. And uh, to that end, we, we've created uh, the, the titular uh, uh, gem, Ember CLI Rails, and we're dogfooding it in this large, complex app. So I just wanted to mention that real fast. So uh, I'm going to give you a plan, kind of what I'm going to be covering. It's, it's going to be pretty basic. Uh, I was lucky enough to have Sandy Metz help me with this talk a little bit. Just uh, some basic slide etiquette and how to talk to the crowd. And she said, uh, she said uh, give the talk that you would have wanted to see six months ago. And uh, to that end, I, I've, I've tried to do that here. But uh, kind of before I can do that, I need to give you a brief introduction to Ember.js, uh, just so that we're all on the same page and we're speaking the same language. Uh, but uh, after that, we're going to talk about the history of Rails and Ember and how these two tools have uh, interacted and historically and how uh, Rails developers have used and utilized uh, the front end, this front-end framework. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce you to the Ember CLI Rails gem, which uh, I am a co-author of and maintainer, along with Sean Doyle and uh, Pavel Provacid. Um, and it's, uh, it's our attempt to kind of help facilitate and smooth over some rough edges that, I'll, uh, that will become more clear soon. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the goals of the, Rails, uh, the Ember CLI Rails project and what we want to accomplish. It's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, that, that simple, but this is kind of the, the, end, the end of the talk, and it won't, it won't take too, too long. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, so a uh, brief introduction to Ember, Ember.js. Um, Luke Melia mentioned, uh, wrote a quote in a talk in 2012, I want to say, saying that 98% you know, of building an app is understanding your layers and knowing where your code should go. And I think this is something that resonates a lot with Rails developers. Uh, very frequently, we, we want to get up and running quickly with new apps and new ideas. And once you know where things should go, um, all of this, this process becomes a lot easier. So um, Ember takes this to heart, and it's part of its main philosophy, is just trying to compartmentalize this stuff and make sure that things are 
known. You, you have a place to put this, this piece of logic. Um, and to that end, you know, many people call this an MVC uh, framework, a uh, front-end MVC, uh, which kind of gets a bad rap from some people. Um, but it's, it's only kind of uh, MVC. It's kind of more like MVC R+. Uh, and uh, I had another slide before where essentially this all breaks down and you, the acronym no longer makes sense. But uh, yeah, uh, anyway, so, so if you want to think about it in the terms of MVC R, let's talk about uh, the router first. Um, and I know that's at the end of the acronym, but I'm putting it first because Ember puts it first. The router is the way that you uh, serialize your data. It's the way you nest your UI, and, and things should be copy and pasteable. You should be able to copy and paste your URL, and the URL is at the, front, the, the forefront of all Ember apps. Uh, you should be able to copy and paste your URL, give it to someone else, and the application should be able to boot into the exact state that that person uh, was in. Um, so it deals with application state, and it uses uh, HTML5 APIs and some fallback uh, stuff to ensure that the URL is updated per route transition. So you're always able to use the back button in the way that you'd expect. Um, yeah, so now the M in MVC, R plus. Uh, models are for persisting objects. Um, this is not entirely accurate, or at least it's not quite detailed enough. Uh, there are other objects that are actually responsible for doing the serialization and deserialization, and then also doing the persistence uh, on the back end. And those are serializers and adapters. So I like to think of models as a, a schema for, for those other objects to have the minimum set of information they need to do their jobs correctly. Uh, and then you have views, and views deal with DOM interactions. Um, views and uh, controllers are going to be kind of merged soon, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Uh, your, views are responsible for DOM interactions and transitioning DOM events into semantic events. So when I click on an, uh, on an action, uh, I, should, uh, I should handle the click event with a function, and then I should transition that click function into a uh, add user, you know, so I can refer to that inside my system uh, semantically rather than, uh, you know, having just all these random click handlers. Um, yeah, so controllers. So now this is the C. This is kind of the last bit of the, of the overview here. And this is really just pre for presenting the, the data for the view layer to render. Um, it handles uh, computer properties, uh, so you're able to give these to uh, templates, and they're long-lived, so they, they don't disappear when you transition routes. Um, they only disappear when you do a, a, a hard refresh or, um, or manually tear them down. And that's important. The, the, the long-lived nature of Ember gives you a lot of power and uh, flexibility. So, so now you have your little primer of Ember. I know that's too basic. There are talks that, uh, that I, can, I can point you uh, to, to that'll, that'll give this a little bit more meat to, to it, uh, if you're interested. Uh, but why is Ember.js appealing to Rails developers? Um, and uh, I, think, I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, it's one that I, I found myself kind of wondering when I see all these other frameworks around, why would I choose Ember um, as a Rails developer? Um, yeah, so the first one is, uh, is Yehuda. So, Yehuda Cats is, uh, or was rather, Rails Core. Uh, started in, started uh, Rails Core in 2008, and then for two years worked on the Merb merge. Uh, during this time, uh, you know, Rails was in. Uh, they, they, there was a lot of work to be to be done with Rails, and uh, he was pushing a lot of that. Um, and then in 2010, the Merb merge happened, and we got uh, Rails 3. So uh, that happened in 2010, and then he remained on Core, doing a lot of really good work until 2014. Um, and in 2011, Ember was released, and he's the co-author of, of Ember. So I think uh, what I'm trying to say when I say Yehuda specifically is that there's a lot of crossover ideas. So a lot of the pain that he was feeling in Rails uh, were the, the solutions that he was trying to implement uh, were, were brought over into Ember. So that's, that's uh, pretty important, I think. Um, yeah, and then this, this is the mantra that all new Rails developers are, are taught, uh, convention over configuration. Uh, you should be able to get up and running with Rails, and you should be able to get up and running with Ember very quickly, and you should not have to waste all of this cognitive uh, um, mental uh, ability. You should not have to waste it making all these micro decisions at the onset of a project. A lot of decisions should be made for you, and they should be made with uh, the community at large in mind so that you get a, a rich and varied uh, understanding of the problem space. And I think this is something that really resonates with a lot of Rails developers. Uh, shared nomenclature-ish, kind of. There's an asterisk there. So views are not views and controllers are not controllers. But I think it gives us enough, uh, 
uh, understanding, shared understanding, to start very quickly tying the connections as Rails developers. You see Ember and you're like, oh, okay, I'm used to seeing logic. I'm, li I'm used to seeing structure. I'm used to seeing, uh, knowing where to put things and, and all this stuff. And, and the shared nomenclature allows you to quickly draw out that little mind map so that you can start building things. Uh, and this is something I mentioned earlier. Uh, emphasis on meaningful URLs. Uh, Rails does this really well. Uh, it's RESTful, typically, and, uh, and the idea is to keep the URL focused on resources. And there's just a slight shift uh, in Ember to basically making the URL represent UI nesting. Um, but the, the importance here is that Rails developers are already taking the URL into account, and it has to be first class. Um, and then the, the final and probably most important is that there's a focus on testing. Ember really tries very hard to ensure that you're able to test everything. Um, and Rails, that's, that's the other focus. You know, Rails really wants you to be able to test your things and have this like, security and the knowledge that your code will work when it's deployed, uh, that you can uh, bill a client and, and confidently say that their product is, is what you said that their product would be. So that's something that, uh, that Ember and Rails definitely have in common. Um, yeah, so yeah, Rails loves... Rails of Ember. <laughs> I don't know why I have that recap slide. Uh, so to that end, I, I wanted to mention this real fast. In, in EmberConf, uh, 201 created a uh, consultancy in uh, New York City, released a, a survey that many people who are going to EmberConf uh, partook in. And uh, this is one that I thought was particularly apt, especially for this talk. Uh, I don't know if you can see, it's probably really tiny. But the, the big bar over on the left is Rails. And, uh, and this is all of the people who are using Ember at EmberConf. What do they prefer to use for their server side? And the overwhelming percentage is Ruby, with over 50% using Rails, or not Ruby, Rails, using Rails as their, as their back end of choice. Because it's just productive. There's just a lot of things that Rails gives you. It's great. It's, it's awesome. There's, there's really, you can get up and running and be productive very quickly. So, I don't know. I think that's why Rails loves Ember. I think people see these, these commonalities and they just dive into it and they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try very hard to, to see where these pieces will fit. And if you, if you get it to fit, then you're going to have this explosion of productivity. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so now we're going to move into the, the meat of the talk here. Talk about a history of Rails and Ember. The history. Sorry, I had changed it from an indefinite to a definite article because I'm actually describing real things that actually took place, not just kind of, you know, Hand wavy stuff. Uh, so yeah, so the, the first, uh, the first uh, in, in the beginning, you know, uh, of Ember, Ember used globals and in in, in, in inline templates. So uh, once again, this slide is probably a little too small. I expected I should have zoomed in, uh, but you can see that there's actual inline templates being embedded into the HTML, and then uh, you do some include tags to ensure that you have all of Ember's, or all of Ember and all of Ember's dependencies uh, loaded. And then you can just create the, uh, the JavaScript on the right. It's a very simple Ember application that all it does is going to uh, is loop over uh, that model there and print out red, red yellow, blue. Um, and this is interesting, right? So this is still uh, possible now. You, this, is, this was from just the other day. I encourage you to go to emberjs.jsbin and, and fiddle around. It's, it's very valuable. And uh, frequently, if you discover a bug in Ember, they'll ask you to go into an Ember.js bin and recreate it here. Because if you do it here, it's a problem with Ember. And, uh, and it's not a problem with your dependencies and your situation. So it's actually a really cool tool that you're able to still do this. And this is still supported. Um, yeah, so, so this is what's Ember, what Ember is doing in, in circa 2011, I want to say. Um, and right around the same time, uh, you know, Rails developers kind of caught this. And they're like, we need some tool to integrate these things. How are we going to do that? So, they create the Ember Rails gem. I mean, simple enough. You'll, you'll see the common uh, uh, pattern here when we just affix Rails to the end of whatever Ember is doing, and that's the new thing. Um, so these, these boxes here represent kind of the things that, and, and it's not always applicable. It's kind of imperfect. I wanted the slides to kind of look right. But uh, these are the things that you generally need for a successful web application. You need to be able to deal with your APIs. You need to do t deal with testing and asset compilation serving. And it's really nice to have uh, generators to help you get up and running very quickly. Um, so yeah, so this is globals. It's using globals. And, uh, and it, it gives you a way to uh, define those globals in a, in, a, in a solid file structure. 
And then uh, it uses, I believe, like string concatenation and just puts them in the acid path and allows you to serve them like you normally would. Um, so uh, it does yeah, pre-compiled templates in the acid pipeline. Um, so some of the problems here are that upgrading Ember.js dependencies was kind of difficult because you had to rely on the gem to maintain uh, this, uh, this relationship. So your dependencies were uh, difficult to keep in sync with what you want. Um, oh, and it's, and it's important to note here, and this is something that's common through a lot of these, these new transitions, is that this is still main, maintained. Um, this was used from 2011 until 2013, or as like the, the only way, really, like there weren't any other options until yeah, 2014, 2013. Um, and it's still receiving updates from Ember Core now. So you'll see some of the Ember Core people come in there and try to make sure that these, these, uh, the legacy apps that are still using Ember Rails still works. And this is something that you see a lot. You see a lot of this, this extra work coming back to try to make everything compatible. Core team, super cool. Um, yeah, so, so this, is what, uh, this is what Rails is doing. And now we're gonna step back over to um, what Ember is doing. So uh, I think, I'm trying to remember the dates. 2014, uh, Steph Penner uh, starts Ember App Kit. And it's a precursor to Ember CLI, so it's, it's really alpha software. And what, what the goal of this project was, was to ensure that um, there were solid ways, uh, like solid answers to a lot of these questions that kept arising. So as you're building these projects, how do you answer, you know, like JavaScript is really difficult to develop in at the time and probably still now. Um, so like, how can we make this more pleasant? How can we make people more productive? And this was the first attempt to try to do some, some like architecture, some build tooling around uh, Ember to make the, the experience better. All right, use Grunt build tooling, which uh, Grunt is a, is a build tool that allows you to do all of this really cool stuff, including uh, ES6 versioning. I don't have my, my slide clicker, so I apologize. I have to keep stepping back over to the podium. Um, yeah, so ES6 transpilation. So this is when now we're able to write modular pieces of JavaScript code and explicitly import the dependencies. So we're able to start thinking about things much more modularly and working with JavaScript in kind of like more like sophisticated way. So you're not just concatenating, concatenating things. You're doing some intelligent things to, to kind of make it more enjoyable. Uh, it gives you a solid uh, project structure. Um, so it gives you this skeleton of all of this, uh, the, pl the places, like what Luke was talking about. The, it gives you these places for you to put uh, the, the logical chunks of your code so that you know where, where and what to, to do and, and how to, how to build, start building your project. Um, and this is a plus or minus, uh, it's front end, back end package management with NPM and Bower. Uh, this is kind of asterisky. Um, it, they do good, good stuff, but yeah, there are pain points. And uh, this next slide, I am only including because I spent a lot of time in Pixelmator making it, but that's Bower. That's Austin Bauer, sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, something I wanna, I wanna make, sh make uh, clear about how uh, Ember App Kit worked is when you installed it, it was only, the, it was, its goal was to give you a skeleton structure. So you would actually clone Ember, CL or Ember App Kit and then delete dot .git, the dot .git directory and then get in it your own repo and then you just build inside of that. And that's fine and, and all, but there's no upgrade path. So upgrades are really hard. And this is kind of a, a problem. This is a, this is a really big problem. So people who are early adopters of this software had difficulty trying to get the latest and greatest. So people were asking these questions and saying, well, this didn't work, or this works, and whatever. And as the projects are maturing, they're finding more and more uh, solutions to these problems. But people who already implemented it found it really difficult to, to find a way to get those new changes in. So this is very important. Uh, and of course, Rails, once again, the Rails community kind of rallied and said, okay, Ember App Kit is a thing. Let's make a gem to let us use it right now. So um, it has Rails generators for AppKit resources. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something I really want to stress. Uh, these generators were not just shelling out to Grunt. They were actually rewritten in Rails. So there was double work here. Um, not only were the people working in AppKit trying to get Grunt to do all the right things, there were, uh, there were other people, and sometimes the same people, working on this project to make sure that the generator stayed in sync with what was available at Ember App Kit. This is really painful. This is not a very good workflow um, because getting, this, getting these things, in, keeping these things in sync ended up costing a lot of people a lot of time. Um, but yeah, anyways, those are kind of negatives. I'm trying to 
explain the cool parts of it. Uh, the tests are accessible in Rails land, so you can write Q unit tests and you can access them via an engine, I think. Um, and that's really cool. So you're able to kind of do Q unit, uh, Q -unit tests and, and, and test your, your JavaScript in a, in a sensible way, and you can kind of view it in Rails and have it be accessible via the command line. It's pretty cool. Um, it did some simple API versioning, which uh, at, uh, I think I think uh, talked to uh, some of the some of the maintainers of this gem, and the simple API versioning was great for the majority of cases, but there were some edge cases that were a little weird. Um, and uh, you know, it, it compiled to AMD. So this is uh, this is from Ember AppKit, but it compiled to AMD. Um, they had to write the way that this compiled to AMD by hand in order to get some speed uh, boosts over Grunt. So that was uh, another pain point where there's a lot of double work. And upgrades are hard. Upgrades are really hard. So once again, if you start an Ember AppKit Rails project, getting the new latest and greatest Ember AppKit stuff is just hard. It's not easy. So, so that's what Rails is doing. To try, the Rails community is doing to pull in this Ember work. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's a really solid effort. I think it's a very noble goal to do. Um, and then uh, we see the successor of Ember AppKit, Ember CLI, uh, be announced at EmberConf 2014. Uh, and I think the work began a few months uh, prior to that. And uh, it changed a few things, including the build tool, which uh, before was Grunt, as I mentioned, uh, but now is Broccoli. And Broccoli is this really uh, clever abstraction uh, for uh, dealing with uh, the asset pipeline problem. Um, and it's uh, very extensible. So they were able to build really robust tool set for uh, using uh, for quickly building assets and quickly building and rebuilding assets. Um, it had a testing harness out of the box. Uh, so did Ember AppKit, but the, uh, this is a much more robust solution. So you have Testum straight away. Uh, Testum allows you to run your tests against multiple browsers in your command line, and that's really cool. Uh, and I think, I think it's, it's really cool because you can even do things like spin up a VM and have your tests run on, on, on an IE virtual machine, just like, Really, really highly configurable, very robust. You can still access, the, access it via an express server, so you can actually go to a browser and run QUnit tests there. Uh, there's constant improvements. So in 2014, when Ember CLI was released, uh, there were maybe five or six Ember shared libraries. Libraries that if you started an Ember app over here and you started it over here, you would be able to share eight-ish libraries. Uh, and Three or four months after Ember CLI was announced, they announced that they were going to incorporate add-ons. And add-ons allow you to write really super compartmentalized code and customize your Ember CLI experience without having to, to actually get changes merged into Ember CLI. So it allows you to make Ember CLI work for you in uh, much, uh, like a much richer variety of ways. Uh, and now, add-ons, there are over 1,000 add-ons. So within, within the space of a year, uh, people have really gotten busy putting these, these new tools and this new, like making Ember CLI more robust. So now I'm able to start a project and incorporate things. I need a button. I need this, this kind of uh, simple auth or something, you know, all of these things. If I need these things, I can just pull them in with one command line rather than having to re-implement it myself. Uh, and upgradability. The upgrade story was the main focus, I think, of Ember CLI. That's my personal opinion. I don't know if that's actually true. Uh, so, so Ember, CLI is a command line interface, obviously, and it provides you a, a command called Ember init. Um, so once again, this, the skeleton structure was kind of the goal. Ember AppKit tried to build this, uh, this way for you to clone in a project structure, make it your own, and then start building right away. Uh, and Ember CLI is trying to do the same thing, but now to create that skeleton, it uses these things called blueprints. And then when, uh, when changes are merged upstream of Ember CLI, you're able to get these, these changes uh, pulled into your, your code by doing this guided upgrade with blueprints used as diffs. So for each file in the default skeleton, you're gonna see a diff of what's, what was pushed on to the latest version you're upgrading to, uh, and, and what you have, and you're able to actually reconcile those two things so you can very smoothly upgrade. Feels a little clunky at first, but once you do this two or three times, this, be, this turns out to be a very elegant way to keep uh, on the latest and greatest thing. So, so we got here to this Ember CLI land, and everything's kind of good, and, all, every, everyone's pretty happy. So how do, how do the Rails developers decide to use this and utilize it? Well, they didn't build a gem. They just completely separated everything. And, excuse me. Um, and in an ideal world, 
you know, if you start talking about architectural purity or, you know, the kind of where things, where the separation should live, um, this kind of makes sense. Um, so both sides are tested independently. Um, it allows for greater special, specialization. Uh, so you're able to, you know, focus on your strengths and you're, you're, you're able to, to hire for, for very specific sections of your code. Uh, the tested independently means that you have to, you know, write your integration tests stubbing out the back end in Ember. Uh, and then you write your API tests in Rails. Um, and that, that turns out to work okay. It uh, gives a flexible back end. I know we're all Rails people here, so we're all kind of, you know, we want to use Rails, and I think that's a good choice. But if you wanted to write it in something else, you can do that. Um, and it's kind of separation of concern at a system level, so you kind of keep things completely separate. Um, so, so this sounds great, but what are the kind of perils or pitfalls of using this style of approach, you know? Uh, I know uh, DHH mentioned monoliths. Uh, this is not a monolith. This is, uh, you know, these are, these are disparate uh, things and trying to keep them in sync becomes difficult. So what are the, what are the issues? This is not an integrated system. I'm sorry, integrated system. Um, yeah, so, uh, so there's no full stack acceptance testing conventions. It's not that you couldn't do it. You can do it. I'm gonna show you a slide in a minute that shows you some kind of, some of the ways that we work around things. So there's no uh, full stack acceptance testing conventions, but you could use Foreman to spool up the, the um, either, either side, the Ember app and the Rails app, and then uh, proxy one to the other, and then point Cucumber to it. But you, you can see, like, already, if I go to another project, I'm gonna have to reintegrate this. So this is not what we were talking about earlier, where this convention over configuration, we don't wanna make these micro, micro decisions at the beginning of the, of the, of the project. Um, so it's ad hoc development workflows. This goes along with the same thing. A lot of conventional problems here where we just don't know what to do. Um, and people are struggling, to, not struggling, people, are, people are, are investing a lot of time finding the answers to these questions. Um, so it's, it's cool, but like people write things like this. Like this is actually out of one of my original apps that I did uh, separate. And I don't know if you can see the code here, but um, can everyone see it? Yeah, yeah? all right, cool. Um, so yeah, so it, it basically, it just, it's a rake, rake file that you run, uh, you run just rake, and it's gonna spool up to things like I was mentioning. So it's CD, so this assumes that back end and front end, uh, back end being the Rails app and front end being the uh, Ember app live in the same directory, and it boots them up and it points them and hooks them all up together, and then you can develop, right? But once again, I'm having to do this, and I'm probably not gonna do this the same way twice. Uh, two teams are probably not gonna do this the same way. So, uh, and it doesn't work well with uh, existing applications. So the, the kind of uh, the, the line that people try to draw here is uh, when you start working with Ember CLI, if you say, oh, I have an existing app and I want to use Ember CLI, people will tell you just do a rewrite and you know, separate your app and have, have this, this complete separation. But that, that's not possible for a lot of people. A lot of people have invested years building these applications and uh, you know, have teams that are Rails focused and need transition uh, periods to learn new technologies and become efficient and proficient at these, at these like, advanced things. And once again, a learning curve is not always easy. Um, so it doesn't work well with that, uh, current application. Complete separation doesn't work well with existing applications. Yeah. Um, deployments can become more complicated. So once again, this has to do with conventions. A lot of this has to do with conventions. There's knowing where to do, what to do and when to do, that, do it. Um, but uh, you can see that it gets pretty complicated. This is, uh, so Ember CLI deploy is an Ember CLI add-on that is geared towards deploying uh, Ember CLI apps um, with, you know, XYZ backend. Rails is very common. And, uh, and the diagram for that looks a little bit like this. So I'm not gonna go into too much details. This, this is actually an excellent architecture, and once you get this running, it's amazing. But you can see that you have to do a lot of upfront work trying to understand why these things need to be, do, uh, be done this way. A lot of this has to do with cores. You want to serve your index.html from uh, your Rails server, uh, your API server, and then you want to serve the assets from a CDN uh, behind CloudFront, uh, and trying to make sure that those things both uh, know, uh, because the assets are fingerprinted, know about each other. Uh, you have to use Redis as an intermediary. Uh, and, and it's, it, once again, this is actually a really great solution, uh, but it's, it's a little more complicated, and, uh, and it would be nice to, to wrap this up. Um, so yeah, so that's pitfalls. So, um, so where does Ember CLI Rails, the gem, uh, sit? Um, well, oh, this is my favorite part of the talk. Favorite part of the talk. It's the only animation I have in all my slides. Hold on. Someone say a whoosh. Whoosh. 
Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so the responsibility of Ember CLI Rails kind of sits like this, and you'll see that this looks immediately uh, very familiar uh, to the way Ember AppKit did it, Ember AppKit Rails did it, the, the gem uh, to utilize Ember AppKit, um, but it's even thinner. So it's, it's not trying to rewrite the generators, it's not trying to, um, to do the job of, of Ember CLI. All it's doing is it's doing the bare minimum that it needs to do uh, to allow you to close the air gap uh, between the front end and the back end with clumsy separation. And it's, letting, it's trying to let both Ember and Rails do their own thing, independent of one another. So all of the commands that you use for Ember CLI still work. You still use Ember generators. You don't use Rails generators. You still write your API, and, uh, and everything kind of works great. Uh, and then these testing, th this testing block kind of sits uh, right in the middle, and it allows you to do both integration tests and use unit tests, just like you would with Ember and Rails. So you write your RSpec API tests and QUnit um, unit and integration tests for Ember, and then you can write full stack Cucumber tests if you want to, or you know whatever acceptance testing framework you like. <sighs> yeah, and this uh, this is the 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 goal here is is once again to to avoid the double work of trying to keep these two rapidly moving ecosystems together and unified. Um, so it's really just trying to be a very, very, very thin layer, the thinner the better uh, layer, uh, to just kind of give you some of those conventions and solve some of those pitfalls of complete separation while still allowing you to kind of know where your code belongs. So how does it work? Um, it, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is kind of a, this is not a hand-drawn, this is a hand-drawn sequence diagram. There's a actual, actually a tool called JS Sequence that lets you do this and it looks all hand-drawn, it's awesome. Uh, recommend it highly. Uh, so yeah, so the user will request a page uh, from Rails. Rails intercepts it and say, okay, uh, I know that, uh, you know that, that I need to start or restart the Ember uh, build process and uh, wait for the assets to be built. Because uh, so Rails knows where the Ember apps live. Oh, apps plural, I should say that. Uh, this, unlike all the other tools, allows for you to, uh, to include multiple Ember apps. So you can have multiple, you can have an admin panel filled with all of your, an entire Ember CLI app that is only dedicated to your admin, admin panel, and then you know, your rest of your front end can be in another Ember CLI app, and Rails still is the one place, the one hub, and it's just thin layer. So it's just saying, okay, request the page, um, start, start or restart Ember, uh, Ember builds, and then when it, that's done, we do some, some locking stuff to make sure that you don't refresh and get a weird invalid state, and then uh, you read the assets and you serve them back to the user uh, via the asset pipeline, and yeah, that's, so how do you use it? Um, so you start with an Ember app, um, and then and then uh, you you can you can actually place the the Ember app anywhere you'd like, but um, but I prefer to put mine inside of the root level of the Rails app uh, under a directory called front end, and then any subsequent uh, also in the root of the of the application because it just makes things a little bit easier. And then you run uh, rake Ember CLI init. And that produces this, uh, config this initializer. And uh, you just tell, you're just telling Ember, or you're telling Rails, rather, where the Ember app lives. And then there's, a, there's uh, many configuration options here to make this a little bit more customizable and work for you better. Uh, and then uh, this is from the readme. You can actually do this by putting the, uh, well, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so you, have a, you, you put a root, uh, root path, and then you render an index and then in your index page. Um, so now when you go to slash the app, this uh, ERB template is going to be rendered. And it's going to load the, uh, with the two helpers there, it's going to load the uh, Ember assets so that your Ember app can be loaded. So Ember, Ember CLI will have already built your assets into this nice AMD, and then it's going to be included in the top of your file. And then all of the styles that come from Ember CLI are, are also going to be included. Um, so I'm actually really close to the, to the end of the talk, so we might have time to do some demos. Um, so the goals of the Ember CLI project, um, the, the thing that I want for people to, to kind of understand about this project is that first off, uh, this, is, this is a graph of commits over time to the various projects we talked about in this talk. So the blue line starting in 2011 is Ember uh, Rails, and, uh, and then the red there is Ember AppKit, and you can see that that was almost two years where the, the way you used Ember was uh, you used Ember Rails, if you wanted to use it with Rails. Uh, then, then Ember AppKit came on, on scene, and uh, at, at, 
EmberConf uh, 2014, it was uh, announced that Ember CLI was going to be kind of the way forward, and it was going to—it was eventually going to be included in the Ember like ecosystem officially with actual core team support. And you could see the explosion of commits that happened after that. And this is only from January when I initially created this. Uh, this this graph becomes even more uh, impressive when you start seeing how much work is being pushed into Ember CLI, uh, and and it's really important that you you know that this is not going anywhere. That's, that's the kind of thing. So Ember CLI is here to stay. It's going to be a thing that we use to, to utilize Ember. And it's really, really cool. It does some amazing things. Um, so so with, with, with that in mind, uh, you know, uh, Ember uh, has some 15,000 commits or so. And Rails has like 50,000 commits. I don't know, a bunch. Um, maybe 5,000 a year for 10 plus years, I want to say. Uh, and these ecosystems are vibrant. They're filled with energy. They're filled with people like you going out there and contributing to the code. And it's, and it's awesome. And I want to use both of these technologies, but I don't want to have to keep rewriting these, these things and doing the double work. I want a very thin wrapper that allows these two e ecosystems to work together, but evolve independently. That's the real thing. So that's the goal of the Ember CLI Rails project. And to that end, I think we're going to continue pushing and asking questions on how we should integrate these two services. I would like to see the, I would like to see Ember CLI Rails become even thinner, and and the the interaction just be those conventions. Right now, we're having to use uh, the uh, asset pipeline in Rails, and we're also using an asset pipeline in Broccoli, and that seems like double work. Why are we doing that? So uh, so we're probably going to push that even further out. Um, but there's a lot of questions to be asked. But right now, you can use it right now and start using Ember CLI in your Rails apps. So, yeah. So, maybe we have time for some demos. First off, I'd like to thank uh, HashRocket for the time to kind of work on this talk uh, and some design help and obviously all the support that they give me. Uh, and then I want to personally thank uh, Sandy Metz uh, and Terrence Lee who helped me kind of refine these slides. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. You want, do we have time for demo? How much time? Two, three minutes? Okay, cool. I thought I had changed that. Okay, so uh, so I mentioned earlier that the URL was uh, the URL was at the forefront of of um, Ember's philosophy, and uh, kind of to that end, I noticed something. And this is not a poke or jab at RailsConf uh, particularly. This is something that happens to Conf uh, a lot of a lot of things. Um, it happened to EmberConf. Ember, EmberConf uh, website acted the same way. But you can see when I changed this with JavaScript, I'm getting all the new updated schedule, right? But the URL is not updating. So if I go to Thursday and I scroll down a little bit and then I press refresh, it just kind of like takes me back to Tuesday. I go back in time, and uh, and you know something like uh, and this is the shameless plug. Uh, so this is uh, this is the podcast site that I mentioned that I work on, um, and you can see that when we go into things, the URL is updated. We're not actually doing full page refreshes, and uh, and if I refresh, I'll be on the same page, and the URL is at the forefront. So. I don't know, that's the kind of quick demo I wanted to say, uh, show, and I don't know, hopefully this will get you really inspired to kind of start looking at Ember CLI. Uh, it's an awesome tool, and, uh, and you can use it now in Rails apps uh, with minimal effort. So thank you very much.